Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Christine F. Church Show. You might be listening live here on 1150 AM KKNW in the Seattle area or anywhere around the world on TransformationTalkRadio.com. If you're listening after the fact, you might be listening on ChristineUpchurch.com or one of the dozens of podcasts that sends up. But wherever and whenever, I think you're going to be very grateful you joined us here today because we're going to be talking about um, science in a way we haven't talked about before on the show. And it affects you. It affects your future. It affects our world. But before I get into that, I want to say hello to Ms. Olivia at TTR. Hi, Olivia. Hi there. Um, thank you for doing all your technological stuff in the background and um, helping to facilitate this. And Benny, oh my goodness, I miss seeing you in the studio every week. How are you doing? Oh, doing all right. Miss you too. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, so to speak. And uh, yes. we're on to another great show with you. And we have sunshine today. And yeah. um, it's sort of an interesting juxtaposition because I think that we're in a very sad stage in our country right now. And um, I think that between oppression and COVID-19 and bullying. I mean, there, there's so much negativity in our world. And yet, for many of us, we truly want to shift our own lives, but also to shift this planet. And our guest today is helping to talk about the science that allows us to do that very thing. Uh, imagine being a medical doctor and being so drawn to the, the wisdom and the scientific breakthroughs of one particular person that she changed her life completely. We're going to be talking to her today, but before we get into that, we're going to go to a quick 60-second break, make sure all our technology is in alignment, so stay tuned for more in just a few moments. Welcome back. You're on the Christine Uptrich Show. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited about our guest today. Uh, she's a medical doctor who changed her life completely because she was so drawn to the science of Dr. Bill Tiller. William Tiller is a professor emeritus from Stanford. He's a physicist and engineer. Uh, he's done decades of consciousness research and it's, his work is groundbreaking. He is a quantum physicist but he also has explained to me that there needs to be a new science beyond quantum physics in order to explain many aspects of, of um, the consciousness and intention. So I have great admiration for our guest today because she left a cushy job to, to help us to understand this. Uh, her name is Nisha Manick and she's an alumnus of Mayo Clinic's Division of Rheumatology. She's an internationally recognized leader of integrative medicine. In her commitment to innovative approaches to health and wellness, she seeks to synthesize and unify her work as a physician and scientist with, with and the, the scientists with spiritual inquiry and practice. Related to the subject of consciousness and healing, Nisha moderated um, the Dalai Lama's 14th visit to the Mayo Clinic from the 14th Dalai Lama's visit to the Mayo Clinic in 2008. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom. Uh, she's our guest today, Dr. Nisha Manick. Hi, Nisha, welcome. Namaste, and thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so grateful to have you here. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, I love your book. I'm not sure if this is in camera view or not. Uh, <laughs> her new book is Bridging Science and Spirit. The Genius of William A. Tiller's Physics and the Promise of Information Medicine. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that, con that concept, information medicine. Mm -hmm. And before we get into some of the details, and the details are fascinating, I want to talk a little bit about what motivated you to upend your life mm. and go follow Bill Tiller. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that have really informed my life is the search for truth. Mm. And we all in some way are doing that. You know, we look to our own families, societies, we have structures and education. We're always looking for the truth, ultimately. Right. 
And for me, that inquiry to find the truth was in science. Science is, a, is an enormous way, a very relevant way in, in modern society to understand nature and we are part of nature. So we have a scientific question, we gather data and information and analyze it, and then we find patterns. Right. We find patterns to inform our lives. Yes. I wear the seatbelt. Okay, so I, I'm a former research statistician. I used to design and analyze clinical trials and cancer research before I went into alternative healing. So again, my passion is the same as yours, finding truth. And there are so many different layers of truth. Yes. Um, yes. And I know that with medicine, they tend to view the human body as this functioning mechanical system, mm -hmm. this biochemical system. Yes. And so what prompted you to look for the truth that goes beyond that? So you're right. Medicine is stuck in chemistry. We're stuck in the structure, the nervous system, the muscular system, the vascular system. And that's what, what I was taught in medical school. Uh -huh. But you know, we are much, much more than that. And when I first sat down with Tiller on a Thursday, you know, it was called Thursdays with Tiller. Every Thursday for three to four years, we met in Scottsdale and Tiller says, you know, you know something about chemistry. I respect that. And you know something about energy, energy medicine, which is how I had approached him in the first place, uh -huh. subtle energies. And he says, no, Nesha, we're going to develop something even grander. We're going to look towards information medicine. And I had never heard of such a thing. Information uh -huh. medicine. What is that? I know chemistry, I know energy, but information was a completely new ball game for me. And we went there in, in all of those conversations, I began to understand some of the foundations for physics in energy. And that would lead us to information, which is really intention. Intention uh. is a process of creation. Intention is so important in creating our stories, our lives, and understanding ourselves. Intention brings, well, let me put it this way, in a, in a, in a reverse way. It gives meaning to your life. Mm. Meaning that, is more that's, fundamental, yeah. Yeah, and that is so true that it does give meaning. Uh, but is there science to back it up? Yes, and this is where, you know, when I approached Tiller, it was around subtle energies. But it was something else that really made me stop in my tracks, and it's this. Tiller changed a material such as water with just his intention alone. So, and I have a glass of water here. I was drinking water before we got on. Imagine that, Christine, you and I were to change something about this water, and he chose the measurement of pH. Uh -huh. Water yes. is neutral, and water is what we are. Tiller set out to prove and test himself. Can his intention change water? That was his first target. With nothing else, just his thinking, thought is intention. Uh -huh. And he did that. He did that in the lab. And to him, intention is just as real as a chemical reaction, just uh -huh. as real as any physics equation. And that was stunning to me. At first, I was very doubtful. I had a huge skeptical mind that this man could even do it. Uh -huh. I'm reading his papers, but something inside said to me, pay attention. It was, you might say, a sudden hunch or intuition to just, uh -huh. just play with this, just stay with this. Don't diminish it and don't brush it aside. Not to brush it aside, but uh -huh. I say, give it meaning. And I gave it meaning. One of the things that I find so interesting in, in your book, you describe about mm -hmm. um, Bill's intention experiments. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he found was so important in these experiments was for a person to have sort of a, a clear mind, be mm -hmm. focused, as opposed to be scattered the way we often are in, in our daily lives in Western yes. culture. Yes. Um, so what does it mean to have that focus and clarity? Yes. yes. 
you know, Tiller wouldn't work with me. Uh, and, and he actually said, if I were to include you in my universe, he didn't quite use those words, but I could tell. He says, first, I don't have any funding for you. And that didn't matter to me. I was with the truth. And something told me he's on to something. I want to uh -huh. know more. Yeah. He said, before I work with you, you must meditate daily. And, you know, fast forward several weeks later, when I'm sitting down with him, he said, you know something, when you meditate, it will take you time to clear up your inner crap. Okay. And here we are, you know, we are in the midst of a pandemic, and the ground has shifted. There's great chaos outside, and we have retreated inside to a great coherence. Oh. We are capable of that in our busy lives, the world over this great country, America has retreated inside. We have all taken an action together. We have aligned <laughs> ourselves. And Tiller was saying, align yourself to a sharp focus like a laser and you can take time to do it. Here, the COVID-19 has almost uh, an unseen thing has cohered us into a very unified action coherence and in our minds and an outer action can uh, be aligned together that's what Tiller was really trying to refer to but it can take a little while for yeah. me and I and I see that it, yeah one of the things that's happening as we sort of are on our a global retreat and and self-focus if you will mm -hmm. there's also the the chaotic crap as he called it coming out before our very eyes mm -hmm. the the bullying the violence the the yes the resistance to taking safe approaches mm -hmm. um as well as people suffering greatly financially you know losing their their homes um, losing their jobs and it's the kind of thing where on the one hand it does feel very much like there's this centering and this focus but on the other hand, if we pay attention to the external world, it looks like there's a whole lot of crap that needs to be cleared out. Absolutely. But you know something, something has happened. And this is my observation and talking to people and my patients that in this great chaos outside and as they retreated, for many, they took time to have a self-reflection what's really important what am i designed to do that brings us back to that meaning okay yeah. so yeah. as we re-emerge out of our homes it'll be very interesting to see do we bring that inner coherence outside now mm -hmm. do we carry forward our inner uh inquiry and i think we will we're having a simplified life we're eating meals together we're um we are maybe separated, but I'll tell you, personally, I'm more connected to my family than ever before. I know their favorite colors. I know what's on their minds. I know what their days and weeks were like. I know what we're doing to troubleshoot COVID-19. We have all the pieces. We're not ignoring the outer chaos, but we have come together in very unusual ways in our life. I'm very appreciative of that. Okay. And, and, and what, I know, Christine, I even said before we got on, my intention was to be on your show and it's manifesting. So, yes. so intention is recreating your story. You can recreate your future life now. Mm -hmm. It's in this present moment. Give it meaning. Give it importance. Intention is information. And you know, Tiller said something very crucial. And if we can understand this thing deeply, even as I'm talking to you, I'm using energy. Mm -hmm. My brain cells, my breakfast, my movement of my hands. Tiller right. said, intention is a source of energy. Uh -huh. Intention and energy are connected. Once you know that, that truth can really power our life. Mm -hmm. Intention is a resource of energy. So what's the difference between energy and information? Mm -hmm. So this brings us to the great truth. You know, when people say energy is everything, energy is a great currency to move things forward. And I bring steam engines. That was our industrial revolution of energy. We harness energy to create great machines. 
the machine is also here. The mitochondria create energy in the form of ATP. But once you have intention, now you're, you're bringing that laser-like focus to energy uh, to do useful things. Let me give you an example that I've used sometimes. You see a bookcase behind me, okay? Uh -huh. That's my library. What if we tip it over and we just scatter all the books aside? Okay, everywhere. Now, it takes in Nisha's energy to put things back again, okay? I can use my energy to put those books back, but it will take information to know which book goes where. Right. It organizes the energy. Energy by itself is not useful. So when Tiller says intention, first of all, you have coherence, but you organize the energy flow, okay? okay. That's very important. That, that makes you know, perfect sense, because I think I'm often thinking about tapping into the information in the field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, perhaps that that requires energy to do that. And so it's almost like there's this, this library of structure, right, yes. that yes. we can access, mm -hmm. and then take a piece of it or take it, you know, what, whatever we will talk about what consciousness is and where it is in a minute. Mm -hmm. But take a piece of that take a part of, 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 you know, where I'm coming from and then focus that to, to create an intention for the future. Yeah. Um, yes. So we throw the word consciousness about, mm -hmm. and I think about it's a key part of intention and sort of following the path to intention, right? Mm -hmm. What is consciousness and, and is it up here in our heads? What a great question. You mentioned the word field, and we can come back to that, because the word field, I am very specific in my book, but consciousness is the great mystery in science, okay? We really searched for this, and in, in medicine, we've searched, I, I believe, in the wrong way. We have looked for where the light is better, and it's better in the brain MRIs. Okay, uh -huh. we look at the brain, the functional MRI, blood flows and beautiful pictures. But I can tell you when I have a preference for the color blue or my preference for Kenyan coffee, this wasn't originating in my brain. It was programmed later on. I had this primary conscious, um, it's an everywhereness, okay, consciousness is not locked in to a structure like the brain. It's formless beyond space and beyond time. So when we say the word, where, oh, the question, where is consciousness? Uh -huh. the, the where word misleads us. Where means where, spatial, uh -huh. space. And consciousness is awareness. And I think we have to understand even how we ask the question, okay? okay. So consciousness is awareness. It is beyond space and beyond time. It is essentially us. It is our essence. And then we go into just the levels of consciousness. It's not just one thing. We have the consciousness of courage. We have the consciousness of grit and inquiry and even Christ consciousness, right? There are all these different um, manifestations or expressions of consciousness. And I go into that in my book. So I call it the tyranny of brain science. And Tiller showed that to me, that when a human, an adept human who has meditated for a long time, holds a single intention, a single thought, they can imprint and impact a machine in a very stable way. Now okay. that machine is conscious. It holds right. something of yes. human energies and information. So yeah. it's not just the brain, that machine is conscious too. Yeah, I was a part of um, several different types of uh, research healers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I did was I did energy healing mm -hmm. on damaged DNA, DNA that had been heat shocked in a okay. machine. So I was, I was basically doing healing on a machine. And then they looked to see how fast the damaged DNA rewound. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of thing where 
I know that that's living thing, right? As opposed to a machine. Um, but I also did some stuff with extremely low frequency meters and stuff like that, where, where it's like, yeah, you can, you can manipulate things that the machines are picking up, but are you really manipulating the machine? Mm -hmm. Well, we are and we aren't. The machine actually in the Tiller device that I'm referring to stores is a repository for the subtle energy information. It's not electromagnetic. Okay, so we're now going into an area of science of physics, which is the standard model. Okay, okay. that's where stuff is. That's where matter works. That's where atoms and molecules work. This is how I'm also, we're communicating here through right. electromagnetism. I can see you, you can see me. And my words are being transcribed into electromagnetic signals. But what Tiller is saying that this machine, he calls it just a training device, is a tool to make your intention like 24 seven, to be it coherent and laser-like to show that it can do something. So we as human intenders can impact machines in uh -huh. a stable way. I wouldn't try this in a slot machine in Vegas, but people, <laughs> people <laughs> actually have done that. It's some, some very high level intenders can actually do that. And I uh -huh. refer to Dr. Joseph Gallenberger of Monroe Institute. Now I'm going into a tangent here, but um, the machines or crystals or any material that you want are like a tool. And as you raise your awareness, you won't need them. You can let them go, okay? Uh -huh. So Tiller used a device in the physics lab because he wanted to set a protocol that other labs can follow, that we can follow. And I have a Tiller device, I carry it, I imprint it, I experiment. Okay. But as we grow in consciousness, we'll find that we won't need these things. Right, and, and sort of like a really rudimentary version of that, I think about people using a pendulum yeah. and how, I mean, you can actually test a pendulum to see if its orientation is, is correct yes. for, you know, yes. where you are, you know, if you're coherent enough to use it. And then you get guidance based on that. But you can also just access the information directly and get that intuitive guidance without needing to, to watch it spin. Right. So what you're talking about is a subtle energy effect that subtle energies and that information are connected. When you're using a pendulum or you're doing muscle testing with kinesiology, it's uh -huh. not a local response as you're, you're intuiting it. It is the field. Uh -huh. And you're connected to that field through your acupuncture system with your higher symmetry level. Nature has symmetries, but so does the human body. So what does that I mean, a higher symmetry level? Mm -hmm. what, so nature has, has um, when you organize, uh, in physics, when you organize uh, the matter and its levels in the nuclear physics, you call it U1 gauge, SU2 gauge, and higher, okay? So there are these symmetry levels, and the mathematics is symmetrical. So electricity okay. has electrons flowing, and a symmetry is magnetism. When you move a magnet, you create electricity, okay? There's symmetries like that. So in the body, you have the atom molecule level, which is the atom molecule stuff, but internally, the human body has the highest symmetry level, which is the acupuncture system. Higher still, that Tiller postulates is the chakra system, okay? So the, 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 the pump inside of us the real pump, the energy pump is the acupuncture system. That's the subtle energy. So when you meditate, when you do Qigong and Tai Chi, you're actually um, activating with your intention. You have to uh -huh. intend, you know, I'm on my mat. Right. I, I say, this is my practice for the next half hour. And you, you can feel things. You can feel the subtle energy like a ball between uh -huh. your fingers. That's the symmetry. That's the acupuncture is the internal symmetry of the body. But here's the mystery. You know, when, when you do dissections of the body, you, don't, you can't see these things. Right. You don't in the energy superhighways or the structures, although more recent work in the last five or 10 years, there has been work from Harvard University that in fact, the connective tissue 
seems to be where the acupuncture system lies. The energetic systems actually um, communicate with the connective tissue. So, so are we talking like fascia that? here? Yeah, the connective. fascia. The fascia. Because I, I think that um, there's a burgeoning science right now relating to fascia and how it's connected to our emotional system and and mm -hmm. um, the, the dysfunction it can create. And so it's fascinating to think about that being the communication system for the, the, the yes. flow of the energy through the acupuncture meridian. You know, I have to say, Christine, in, in medical school, that's the, the connective tissue was the least interesting. We used to dump it in the pail. Oh, and it's, no. turning out to be, it's turning out to be the most important structure, okay? It holds, it's really a connective tissue. It connects uh -huh. all the systems, your toe to the brain, okay? It's not separate. Uh -huh. So the acupuncture science has been um, accurate, you know? When you think about the liver and your emotions or the spleen and certain connections in your emotional brain, these are actually real, okay? And I'm not an expert, but there are correlates here. So the fascinating, fascinating. It starts to be very, very crucial. And I think in future in medical science, we will, we will I, I think, teach medical students about this. Fascinating. We have to go to a quick break, but when we return, um, first of all, I'm gonna tell listeners my story of how I spent a day with Dr. Bill Tiller okay. and how wonderful that was. But also, Nisha, I want to want to talk to you about the what happens to certain spaces and and how that relates to entropy, negative entropy, how it relates to intention. But yeah. we have to go to a quick break. Stay tuned for the other side with Dr. Nisha Manik. Welcome back to the Christine Eptrich Show here on KKNW AM 1150 in the Seattle area and Transformation Talk Radio around the world. I'm talking to the author of Bridging Science and Spirit, a very important book, uh, Dr. Nisha Manik. Okay, Nisha, so talked about intention. We talked about consciousness. One of the things that I find so fascinating about Dr. Tiller's work is the 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 science that he's done on the space. When I first met his associate, Walter Dibble, oh. I was working um, for the Reconnection. I was, a, uh, I was on the teaching staff for the Reconnection and helped train people and eventually trained my, at my own seminars there. And he came and he had all sorts of contraptions and he was looking at pH and water. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, what that means to space. But they took the data and he took it back to the, the lab and Bill said, you know, Walt, there's no way I'm gonna believe this. This is an anomaly. There was some, some, something going on. Maybe there was this power plant underneath the, the ballroom of the hotel, you know. He, and so he was doubtful. And so he, they came back and did it again and found that something very significant was going on, that the space was getting charged. Um, but then, I also wanted to talk about how Bill Tiller came to present at one of our mastery conferences. And because I was at the upper echelon of the organization, I was assigned to you know, spend a day with him and his lovely wife, Jean. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed, first of all, at how personable, how kind and how coherent, how centered he, he is. And I got to watch, you know, his presentation more than, you know, I've seen him present a couple of times and he's just absolutely brilliant, but he does have this coherence and just so much light uh, emanating from him. And, it, it, and I feel so blessed to have had that time with him. Yes. Um, but I'm also really fascinated by this concept of how we can shift the space like I, th I think about like going to somebody's party and you walk into the room and it's like oh something doesn't feel right here you know we've all had that experience right and they can explain that with you know hormones from anger or whatever but this was something very different that he's doing what is that about isn't that interesting yeah you you touch on something that bill tiller didn't predict he didn't predict anything to do with the space all he was interested in Let's change the water. 
Let's uh -huh. change the pH. And he found that intention can do that. It does that through a very meditative human. And then the machine is imprinted and it does the water pH change. And it was done in Minnesota. It wasn't done at Stanford. So it was blinded. The lab didn't know the, the directive. But they also monitored the lab space. Uh -huh. Because when you want to change a material in thermodynamics, you want to know the ambient conditions. Okay, you want to know the room temperature, you uh -huh. want to know the room um, uh, physics, the pressure, the all of those things were known. That's numbers, okay? And then you uh -huh. can do calculations. So Tiller, and, and you're right, Walter, I, I'm so glad you brought, brought up Walter Dibble. He's passed away now, but Walter oh, was oh. the experimental and, and Tiller was the theorist. So they were a very, very good team together. Uh -huh. And they would notice these very unusual fluctuations uh -huh. in the data, in the data of the air temperature of the lab and the water pH is fluctuating very rhythmically. It's not uh, this is not anomalous. It was rhythmic. They could see. And if they expand the data, blow it up, so to speak, it's like boom, 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 boom. The temperature was fluctuating three whole degrees centigrade. Nothing to do with air wow. conditioning. Okay. It's nothing diurnal. So temperatures of the room go up and down with the morning or the evening, right? They sunrise, the temperatures sure. go up and the night things cool down. But this was something different. And so Teller did some, a, a very interesting experiment. He says, what were these waves doing? They're phantom waves. And he says, I think, I think this is important. He gave meaning to that data uh -huh. and brush it aside. But he did something very interesting. And I visited his labs in Payson and he's done that over there. He, he took a fan. He said, are these air currents? Because, you know, I can feel a breeze as I wave my sure. hand. But these were very rhythmic and he put a fan there. If there were air currents, Christine, they would be obliterated immediately. Uh -huh. These continued with the fan. Interesting. So this is not air. This isn't diurnal rhythms. This isn't... Um, uh, this isn't from um, the usual physics. Something else is going on. And he reasoned, I bet you this is from the physical vacuum. If it's not stuff, what is rhythmically pumping? He did something very interesting with the data. It's called Fourier analysis. When you have weight, yes. you can, uh, you can um, analyze that mathematically to look at the rhythms. And yes. he found that all of these temperature fluctuations were nesting, okay, from the target yeah. to six meters to outside the lab. It was like it was uh, music going on in, in the room, okay? If we had ears to hear this, I think it would lift us off our feet. So <laughs> you know, like the music of the space was, it, it, and it happened of its own, and he stumbled into it. And that was the key piece to intentions, high magnitude of effects. Uh -huh. And here's the other clue. When I first uh, went to Payson, um, you know, to, to the Tiller physics lab there, I can tell you, I felt something different. Uh -huh. It was a feeling of feeling rested or rejuvenation. And you're surrounded by computers and meters and thermometers and but I commented to Tiller, I said, I feel really good here. And he just smiled. Uh -huh. He says, that's good, my dear. Or you would call me. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I think that's great, Nisha. He says, do you see all this? And he would point the, the thermostats all around the rooms, okay? Uh -huh. So he was not only looking at the target, he, he looked at the space. And I can tell you the biggest secret he stumbled into was this. Human intention, when it's coherent, will lift the space from ordinary reality to a higher symmetry. That, that gives me chills. That gives me chills. Absolutely. It should give you chills because when you're in a higher space, the physics is different. You're in a whole new nature. Yes. And it's very real. And one of the interesting things that, that Walt and Bill found through 
this analysis of the data was that the, the room would shift up to two days before we ever showed up from our various cities to come teach the healing seminar. So it was almost like it, either time wasn't relevant or there was some sort of support from the universe or the information was already there. I, I mean, I, I don't know the, the how yes. or the why yes. behind it, but yes. it was fascinating that it shifted like that. Um, but yes. I, wanna, I, yes. I wanna ask you, when the physics is different, what does that mean in terms of our everyday reality? Yes, when you shift into higher symmetries, the anomalous becomes commonplace, okay? That's where you are now tuning to the, if I talk just to the body as a, as a medical doctor, if you're looking at just the body, the acupuncture system will do remarkable things, okay? It will pump the chemistry. It's the acupuncture system that does things. So if you take your supplement, your turmeric and your vitamin C, why don't you do the Tai Chi and pump it up, okay? Mm -hmm. But here's the other thing. And to me as a medical doctor, this means a heck of a lot. You can create a pumped up space in your clinic. And that's what you did with your hotel seminar. With your intention setting up the equipment, the intention was already creating the space. And Tiller was doing the background recording. And he says to Walter, whoa, the, the pH is already climbing. Their symmetry uh -huh. state is already on its way. So, so when it, the attendees came, they entered a space that was already relevant. You so it's almost like the, the, the coherence in whatever form yes. um, can affect the, the, the space that in turn affects the coherence of people who go into the space, right? The feedback system, right. Yeah. But Tiller also says one other thing, and, and I think we're, it, it is a bit of a jump, but I'm going to say it, that when you talk the physical vacuum, this is very much a part of physics, okay? It's the empty space. It's the right. most abundant thing in our universe. If you look at an atom, a molecule, or us, it's the empty space, even though we think, and I'm, I'm, I'm tapping my glass of water or the table uh -huh. here, it feels solid, but we know it's mostly empty space. What's that thing in there? What's the empty space consist of? This is the magic. That's where Tiller says it is full of potential energy. It's just chaotic. Human intention coheres it. Now that energy begins to be available to us. And it was that space, that energy that changed the pH of the water because you need energy, you need something. Either you put an acid or you shock the water with electricity, but he did none of those things. Uh -huh. He, it was just his intention and the yeah, space lifted. And that's where the energy shifts and changes the materials. The space is more fundamental. And it brought to my mind, you know, when I did research in London, I had the great fortune to be trained in, the, in medicine in the United Kingdom in London. And I worked at St. Thomas's Hospital on the River Thames. Across the Thames is Westminster Abbey. Uh -huh. And every lunch hour, I would go to the Abbey. I wasn't going there to eat my sandwich. I would go there to close my eyes. I thought it was grand and I felt refreshed and I didn't know what I was doing. But I went there just to close my eyes for half an hour and I'd be back to the labs. Right. And now fast forward, the Abbey is a very high space. Its symmetry state is very high over centuries. Right. It has been created consciously with spirit in mind. And it, sta it stands the test of time. And I was going into that space and coming out of it again. Uh -huh. Now, Christina created my space very consciously, whether it's in my new home, whether it's my clinic, whether it's a kitchen, you can create those spaces. You can consecrate those spaces. And yes. they're very special. Yes. Before we go any further, I want to make sure people know how they can connect with you. Um, what's your website? NishaManikMD.com. So it's N-I-S-H-A-M-A-N-E-K-M-D.com. Okay. So um, 
there'll be lot there's lots of radio interviews recommendations and it's mm -hmm. slowly, you know, it's going to expand but that's where to connect with me yeah Thank so you. i've got a, i've got a question for you about the intention because the seminars that i taught at help teach these places the spaces that were getting charged a couple of days before we ever showed up what we were teaching was that attention is far more important than intention when you're interacting with another. Mm -hmm. um, it's coming from this place of allowing and observing. What is it about that that affects the physics? Mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned that. And Tiller did, you know, in your, I think it was the Eric Pearl experiment, yes. Yes. where he noticed that there was this great change in water peach ahead of time. So it was retrocausation, he called it. And right. he, he showed that with many labs, not just um, in his labs, but with Berlin. He had many other uh, investigators he teamed up with later on. Uh -huh. And he said, you could, you could tell a corner in Berlin exactly what to do. And it was ahead before we switched on our device. So something about the field is already activated, okay? Uh -huh. We have to learn a lot, but I'm, I'm giving you the generalities. Right. When you are in a conference, we all bring our intention. That's underneath the attention. Absolutely. You want to give space to the other person. To Your intention is playing out in your attention. Uh -huh. And that is what happens when we have a break. We all chit-chat. We all do things. We all disperse until you notice something in the pH. They all dipped. Interesting. Okay. He said the coherence dipped for a little while, didn't go to baseline, didn't just disappear uh -huh. entirely. When the audience came back, the pH took off again. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that it sort of um, was along with the people's attention and the intention was playing out beforehand. So the right. intention is more primal, okay? And then the attention takes over. That is short-lived. But the intention is is always powering it up. Yes. So one of the things I find so fascinating is this concept of negative entropy. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe for our listeners, first of all, what entropy is yes. and what's the significance of negative entropy and, and how does it fit into all of this? So entropy um, is disorder. OK, so uh, it was described uh, in the 1800s by the physicists who were doing thermodynamics. And um, a great uh, physicist, Ludwig, Ludwig Boltzmann, gave um, uh, the, the physics of entropy. What he said was that when you have a great steam engine, when you have that steam powering that machine through, don't think it's just the pressure and volume. Animating in that chamber are water molecules bouncing crazily, okay? That okay. Energy, that's kinetic energy. That's disorder. And you can do mathematics on that, okay? It's called- it, it, Is there mathematics for my garage? Same we, sort of you thing? Know, we'll get there. And I think <laughs> we need to come in future to measure the symmetry of spaces. I think we're going to go there. And I want anyone who is watching this, the physics brainiacs in your audience, to actually take the science forward. I'm a physician. I'm very interested in the, in the information medicine aspects. We can uh -huh. go there if we have time. But you asked yeah. about neg entropy. Tiller and, and later on physicists have described that, and he saw Liwan Briwan, he was a Frenchman, at, and he said, whenever you create information, you reduce disorder. You reduce Interesting. Entropy, okay? And when you reduce entropy, you have more energy. It's actually standard physics. Fascinating. And so, but that's the place where, where healing occurs. That's the place where insight occurs. It's, it's um, so the reducing entropy is a very positive thing. Absolutely. Neg entropy means you have more energy. Neg entropy is what you are creating in your healing clinics. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, when I, when I sit down with my patient and I doodle, I actually draw a lot of my medical um, advice. It's just, I'm a visual learner and you'll see. Sure. Yes. Science, 
sure there's a lot of doodles and cartoons there. It's, it's how I actually drew the bridge out and Tiller says, I like this bridge, it's gonna stand. Uh -huh. Okay, so he was part of that you know, initial project. When I was with my patient, I draw the information. That exchange increases coherence and compliance in my patient. That is, okay. is coherence, it's negativity. So we're, we're running out of time here and I wanna hear more about how you utilize this fascinating science mm -hmm. and bring it to integrative medicine and, and what your vision of the future is with medicine. Right, you know, when I was at the Mayo Clinic, which is really a tower of conventional care, just the most supremely beautiful conventional care, I felt it was still in, incomplete. I, I just, we're not a bunch of bi biomolecules. And, and it was my patients asking me questions about acupuncture or Tai Chi. And that's what led me to Tiller's work. So what I do now is I do the conventional, I do the chemistry. It's, it's very much part of my foundation, but I also advise energy medicine, which is the highest symmetry state. So uh -huh. I say, here's your prescription. Here is your nutrition. Here is your lifestyle. We have to go there. I right. clarify that. Then we build it to in uh, to uh, energy perspective. So I teach them a little bit of breathing techniques and early forms of Tai Chi. I actually show them the bedside and give them some YouTube videos that they can follow through. That's great. Then I bring in information. I say, your intention is very powerful. And then we talk about spirit practice. So it's doing all those levels. It's not just chemistry, not just energy, not just information, but we bring spirit and you do all of those levels. And I think the outcomes are so much more robust. Interesting. Interesting. Do, do, you, do, you, do you have a, a quick example of one of your patients who, who improved or healed? Yes, yes. So... I've written about Teresa. She actually came to me with arthritis of the ankles. Mm -hmm. And it turned out um, she was a performer, uh, an artist, an actor, a uh, nuncrackers. She used to perform on stage. Uh -huh. And she thought she had practiced too much and her ankles were very swollen. At first, I thought she had rheumatoid arthritis. It turned out she had lupus. And oh, um, yeah, so here we are. We're doing the conventional care. And things are going up and down. They're okay for a while, but she has a flare. And one of the times she came to see me in my clinic, I'm looking at the labs, I prepare for the visit. And when she came in, I was a little bit worried because her inflammatory markers were up. Her blood work showed a bit of anemia. And these are markers of active lupus. And I was okay. really, really concerned. And in she comes, totally vibrant healthy, clear eyes, energetic, and sits down. And we have our, how are you, Teresa? And I said, you know, Teresa, I was looking at your lab work and there's a mismatch here. What are you doing? Uh -huh. And she said, you're gonna laugh at me. And I said, I would never do that. Tell me what you're doing. And she reached out into her bag and she took out guided meditation. Oh. I do this every day. And she would come in from Wisconsin. I do this every day and I can feel my pain go away. She had taught herself meditation. And I took that CD and I looked at it and I said, I'm going to do this. I need to introduce integration of the mind, body, yes. and the physical. I didn't prescribe steroids for her. I said, I'm going to see you a little sooner. Instead of six weeks, we'll make it two weeks. But, but can you come back? And she said, absolutely. And we didn't need to use more medicine. She already was starting to take charge. And mm -hmm. I can give many, many other examples, but here's one who had a serious disease. Yeah. She accepted her medicine, but took charge into meditative practices. She That's took it. Fabulous. Yeah. That's fabulous. I want to mention your book again, Bridging Science and Spirit. I'm fascinated by this book because you take a lot of scientific concepts and help explain, first of all, some of the history and then the fascinating science of, of Bill Tiller. And I, I tell you from the bottom of my heart, I'm really grateful for this because this will help take his fascinating experiments and, and research mind and make this accessible um, 
for places like medicine and into our daily lives. So thank you for that. And, you know, I'm so glad that it became my intention to have you on too, Manic. And uh, I thank you for being here. Thank you, Christine. And if there's one final thing for your listeners, take up the intention today. Take a notebook and just write it out. Wonderful. It's my challenge. And I want to thank you all for joining us here today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you'd like to empower yourself to step further into your vibration of change, please visit my website at christineupchurch.com where you can learn more about my insights, upcoming events, and private sessions.